Hello once again. Welcome to our third Bible study on the topic of miracles. Today we are going to dig into a little bit more on the reaction that people had to Jesus and his miracles and um, maybe not quite what we expect always that, that you'd think if you saw a miracle, uh, maybe you kind of have a preconceived notion of what your response would be, you know, what, what the consequences would be of that miracle. So we'll, we'll look at a bunch of different Bible verses today and then kind of draw some conclusions from that of how, um, especially we're going to look at the miracles of Jesus today, um, not so much Old Testament miracles, um, but really focusing today on the miracles of our Savior. Before we get too far, though, let's begin with prayer, and we'll ask for God's blessing once again. We pray, dear Lord Jesus, be with us in our time today as we go to your word, that word that you've given for our instruction, for our learning, for our encouragement. Grant us that blessing by your Holy Spirit, we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, we will once again look at a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, I need to share that with you, and then we'll get going. All right. There's a little pause to get that pulled up there. Okay, miracles, how awesome are your deeds? We're looking at God's deeds. So by way of introduction today, um, we're going to kind of begin actually with the Christian uh, calendar year. Um, so what's an epiphany? You know that word, epiphany? Might ring a bell. An epiphany, is it a small musical instrument? Is it something hidden that is revealed? Is an epiphany a new Olympic event coming up whenever we have Olympics again? Or is it a surgical tool? An epiphany is, what do you think? An epiphany is number two, something hidden that is revealed. So we have a season of epiphany in the Christian calendar year. And that season of epiphany takes us from the baptism of Jesus to his transfiguration. If you're not that familiar with the Christian calendar year, don't worry. But so we've got Christmas. Everybody knows Christmas. A couple of weeks after Christmas, January the 6th, actually, is the day of Epiphany. And on that day, we commemorate the gospel coming to the Gentiles, the, the Magi come to worship Jesus. That really begins the season of Epiphany. And the season of Epiphany is all about how Jesus is proclaimed to be the Son of God. His deeds show it, the stuff that he did. His words um, show it, the things that he spoke. And a lot of those deeds are miraculous. And so we're going to focus on those. But the season of Epiphany, and also takes it to maybe his um, moment of glory, his greatest moment of glory during his earthly life, the, the day of transfiguration, where he is, is uh, well, there's the word, transfigured on the mountain and a little bit of his glory as God shines forth. Um, but it begins with the baptism of Jesus. So in those couple of weeks, and it's, so the season of Epiphany is kind of the bridge from Christmas to Lent. Um, the baptism of Jesus begins right after January the 6th. Transfiguration is always the last Sunday before Lent begins when we look at the suffering of our Savior. So it's really compressed in there is kind of the whole <laughs> ministry of Jesus in a way. Certainly other parts of the Christian calendar year, we talk about um, the teachings and, and deeds of our Savior, but it's a um, kind of compressed summary of Jesus' ministry. So we're going to begin by looking quickly at Jesus' baptism. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. We could spend all of our class period today on just this verse, this passage, I should say, from Matthew 3. It's fascinating. So essentially, John says, no, don't baptize um, you, Jesus. Jesus says, yes. Why? Not because he's a sinner but to fulfill all righteousness. We have to do this, Jesus said. 
part of his obedience. John consented as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. So there is um, some artwork from stained glass, the baptism of Jesus. Um, this would be a Lutheran baptism of Jesus because he's not being dunked in the water. He's being, uh, it's being poured on his head and it could have happened that way. Um, a shell was a early Christian symbol for baptism as they scooped it into the water. Different topic, different time, but, um, yeah, Jesus was baptized. That's the part we want to notice. And the reaction of the father, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So what was God's message for John? What was God's message we would say for the world at Jesus' baptism? I love my son, and I'm well pleased with him. And that's how everything begins. The ministry of Jesus takes off from there. Um, God's endorsement, God's approval. Like I said, the end of Epiphany is the day of transfiguration, the final Sunday of the church year, right before Lent, right before Ash Wednesday. Um, it marks the time in Jesus' ministry when he no longer comes and goes freely among the people. So really two and a half years of Jesus' ministry are compressed into those few weeks of Epiphany, six weeks, something like that on average. Every step will now lead him closer to Calvary's cross. And what happens at the end of the season of Epiphany? Well, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was, transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. I skipped a couple of verses for the sake of time. While he was still speaking, because uh, Moses and Elijah showed up, um, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is another, since stained glass is our theme today, another rendering of uh, Jesus' lifetime. This is a rendering of the transfiguration. You see he's shining like the sun, his white clothes, Moses, Elijah, or maybe Moses, Elijah. And we've got Peter, James, and John um, in his glory. So it's interesting. You've got these capstone events. Um, God's message for the disciples at Jesus' transfiguration. So you've got baptism, and you've got transfiguration at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and at the end, not completely at the end, but the end of, of a lot of his public ministry going in and out among the people. God says this, I love my son. Again, I am well pleased with him. And he adds here, listen to him. What in the world does that have to do with miracles? Well, think about that. God says, he publicly, privately, publicly, privately, um, it was a small group, right? John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John. That's what I mean, publicly, but still kind of private. This wasn't for the whole world to see. Endorses his son, has the disciples realize who he is, and says, you need to pay attention to him. This is important. Um, it begins, and Jesus goes out into his ministry, and towards the end, it's going to take Jesus to the cross. In between, we have a lot of this, and this is a kind of a summary of Jesus' whole ministry during that time period. Um, we'll get back to that again. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. What did Jesus do? He proclaimed, he preached, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all those who, all who were ill with various diseases, suffering severe pain, demon-possessed, seizures, paralyzed, and Jesus healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. That passage to me, those, those verses kind of summarize that 
time period from Jesus' baptism until his transfiguration, a lot of this. And here's our miracles, right? What was the role of the miracles for Jesus? Well, he proclaimed and he healed. He proclaimed, he taught the gospel. God works through the word. What did the healing do? Well, maybe verse 24 is a good summary of that. News about him spread. Um, was it the news of his preaching? Could well be. Um, was it news about the healing? Probably was, right? And verse 25, large crowds came from Galilee, the Decapolis, so across the Jordan River, um, Jerusalem, Judea, the region across the Jordan, and followed him. So he needed to get the word out, just as the father said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The miracles certainly had a role in that. Okay, there's our artwork, since that's our theme for today. Um, you see here it says Lazarus come forth, and that's a very wrapped up looking Lazarus right there. But one of Jesus' most outstanding miracles um, rendered here in a little bit of uh, stained glass. What I think is interesting about this, so you've got Mary and Martha, and what happens right after this is great opposition against Jesus. And you kind of look at the faces here of these fellas, and none of them are real happy, are they? They're not real happy to see Lazarus alive and coming out of the tomb. Um, so that's, that's, I thought it was a good piece of artwork for us to, to uh, segue into our lesson for today. What did the miracles of Jesus accomplish? So agree, Jesus performed miracles as an attraction. Once people saw what he could do, then they would be compelled to sit and listen. Um, I think for the most part that's true, although I would say this. Um, Jesus performed miracles as more than an attraction. I mean, we talked about that last time. It wasn't just the fireworks. The fireworks had their purpose. Um, Jesus didn't want just people just to go ooh and ah. Jesus wanted people to trust him and believe. That was the greatest purpose. But for the most part, um, yeah, they served as a way to confirm the gospel. But let's, let's look at different Bible verses and see what they have to tell us. Who is this man? So we're going to look at a lot of different Bible verses today. Um, if you want to look them up individually in your Bible, you are certainly welcome to, although you might um, have a hard time a little bit um, trying to keep up because there, we're going to be flipping all over the Gospels, but feel free. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to men. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So... People were amazed uh, at the miracle of Jesus. In that instance, it was the healing of a paralytic. Mark chapter 5, immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. So remember the synagogue ruler by the name of Jairus and his daughter. Um, so Jesus said, Talitha kum, little one, get up. And again, so we've never, they were amazed. They were amazed at Jesus. We've never seen anything like this. They were completely astonished. So that's what the miracles did. They amazed and astonished. Luke chapter 7. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This is one of my favorite miracles, the, the widow at Nain, where Jesus basically and his group go up to the little city of Nain, um, where a woman is bringing her son out of the city, her only son who had died. And so you've got the parade of people, not parade, happy parade, the morning, coming out of the city and Jesus and his group coming together. And Jesus basically stops the procession and heals um, the, the young man. And so look at the reaction of the people. Um, God has come to help his people. So it, again, it was a very positive um, they were filled with awe. There's that word again. They praised God for what God had done. Matthew 15, 31. This one is uh, along the Sea of Galilee. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they 
praise the God of Israel. So we've got a theme going here, right? The people were amazed when they saw Jesus. So let's, I think we've got um, enough evidence there to say that one of the responses of two of the miracles of Jesus was um, awe and amazement. People were amazed by what Jesus had done. Was this the response that Jesus wanted most to his miracles, awe and amazement? I guess I got ahead of myself before um, talking about the fireworks. And I think we kind of covered this that um, no, his greatest, his greatest goal was not to, to you know, just impress them. Um, he wanted the miracles to accomplish something else. And that was to help people put their faith in him to um, believe that, that he was the one sent from God. But awe and amazement, I think, are very positive reactions. And at least that um, it almost seems intermingled at times, you know, that maybe the, the start of faith or or willing to listen to Jesus because of what he's done. God has come to help his people, right? We recognize this is not normal. Dead bodies don't become alive again. Matthew chapter 9, verse 31. Um, this is the healing of two blind men. And when they were healed, they went out and spread the good news about Jesus all over that region. There's a reaction to the miracles. John 5, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made them well. That was the um, paralytic who used to sit at the pool of uh, Bethesda in John chapter 5. And um, so what, what do those two have in common? Think about that. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. So I think there's some commonality, right? From Matthew and John and John. And here, of course, it was the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which I think I've mentioned before, probably was the most impressive in earthly terms of Jesus' miracles, a fellow that was dead for four days. I mean, certain things happen to a human body after four days, right? Um, it's not like uh, he had just had cardiac arrest and, and Jesus gave him CPR. It was uh, four days dead and everything that happens, and Jesus um, healed him. So uh, another strong response from people, and one of the common responses we see to the miracles of our Savior um, was to spread the news. Um, all three of those had that aspect. Uh, the, the blind men, the, the crippled man at the pool of Bethsaida, the crowd after Lazarus was healed, they all went out and they told others. They were excited. They, they spread the news. And that was something that Jesus needed to and wanted to accomplish at times. All right, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 34 is our next verse. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. The occasion there was two blind men um, and a man that was mute. And the Pharisees witnessed the miracle, and that was their reaction. They did not go out and spread the good news. It does not tell us that they were awed and amazed. But they said, this is from the devil. That's the, why he has this power. Mark chapter 3, verse 6, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This was a man fairly early in Jesus' ministry who had a hand that was shriveled. And Jesus told him to reach out his hand and it was healed. And um, that one is interesting because it talks about Jesus' anger and how frustrated he was, how distressed he was by their, by their stubbornness and their unbelief. Um, so um, yeah, their, their stubborn hearts was something that seemed to shock Jesus. And you know, the, the, the stubbornness of unbelief at times, um, we spent a good deal of that on our lesson last time talking ab about the, the power of miracles and what they can and they can't accomplish. And what we probably shouldn't do, though, is equate a miracle with creating faith. And I guess that's what we're kind of covering here again, 
is that um, we had the rich man and poor Lazarus. And what did Abraham say? Even if you know you you came back from the dead, um, it's not gonna it's not gonna change your your brother's hearts. But they have Moses and the prophets. You know they've got the word, and that's what the word is for to change hearts. So um, there's proof, right? The Pharisees saw miracles, and what did it lead them to do? Oh, he's from the devil. Um, we have to kill him, right? That's not exactly the the uh, reaction that Jesus wanted um, to accomplish with the miracles, but it was. So miracles are not just faith creators, I guess is, is the point. In John chapter 12, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This is um, recorded in Holy Week. John is kind of a little bit more... Um, what would you say, non, non-chronological. And to me, it almost seems like a summary there of uh, Jesus' miracles and their role that, um, not that he maybe did all that many during Holy Week, we don't know for sure, but kind of a summary that even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs, they would not believe in him. I mentioned last time also, I think that um, 36 miracles, individual miracles of Jesus are performed. How many actual miracles he performed though? Um, so, so many more because he went to whole towns and villages and we had one of those passages to start with today and he healed many. He may have healed more than 36 in one, in one town at a time. So even after all that, the result was not faith. The result was not awe. The result was not, wow, God has come to help his people. The result was, we are not going to believe in him. And so another response to miracles, a kind of a grouping or things in common that we deduce from our, our texts today is this, unbelief, sadly, and hatred for Jesus. Again, maybe not what you would expect when you think about a miracle, which when people demand miracles today, makes you kind of wonder, um, would we be any different? And so often today, doesn't that happen? You know, people demand a miracle from God and uh, kind of put God to the test. And unless this happens or they put, you know, they put conditions on it, um, I'll believe if. Well, maybe not. M you know, miracles don't necessarily do that. Um, I think they can strengthen us, they, they can draw attention, but they're not automatically faith creators for, for bringing from, from unbelief to faith. Um, some other uh, sort of responses we have here. Um, those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You may have guessed the miracle here. This was after the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus sends his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. And the storm comes up and Jesus walks out on the water to them. And what was the response of the disciples? Truly, you are the son of God. Now, this was not anywhere close to the first miracle that the disciples had seen. But it was this miracle that really seemed to um, strike them. You know, they were fighting against the wind and the waves, and there is Jesus, and it just floored them. Truly, you are the Son of God. We had that one last time with Peter in the great catch of fish early on in Jesus' ministry, and Peter's response was, go away from me. Um, I am a sinful man. So, and he wasn't saying, go away from me. I don't believe in you. Peter was saying, now I know who you are this, you are the son of God. So I, I don't deserve to be in your presence was the response. So um, for the believer, I think in a lot of ways, miracles deepen faith and, and convinced even more. John 2, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. How do you understand that? Does that mean they were not believers up to this point, and the miracle at Cana in Galilee caused them to suddenly believe now for the first time. I, I don't think that's what it's saying. 
remember they had already left everything to follow Jesus. And if you're going to leave behind your life and your work and your livelihood, and for some of them, probably their families, um, probably they're convinced who he is um, as their savior. But even more so, they trusted him, right? And they put their faith fully in him, I think is the point. John chapter 9, then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is that awesome miracle account. Another one of my favorites, the man born blind from John chapter 9. It's just a fascinating chapter of God's word. And um, who are you, Lord? And um, who are, you know, and, and he confesses his faith, then Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So, um, that also was was convinced and and that's the one you know the the pharisees are trying to push him and is he a sinner and the man born blind said whether he's a sinner or not i don't know but i, I tell you one thing i was blind but now i see and uh, do you want to worship him too which he seems to kind of be needling them a little bit i kind of love the the courage of the man born blind and and maybe his a little bit of wit and, and sarcasm perhaps even um, Lord, I believe, um, not sarcastic there though, um, a confession of faith. John 11, therefore many of the Jews who had um, come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Again, that was at the tomb of Lazarus. So the man born blind there and he's healed. And what did he say? Lord, I believe. Um, previous, we had Cana in Galilee. Previous to that, the disciples, truly you are the son of God. And the disciples put their faith in him at Cana in Galilee. And finally, John 4, the man realized this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed that was the official son at Cana as well. So I think we will call that our next grouping of responses that share some commonalities to the miracles of Jesus, I think that we can kind of uh, lasso all together here was that they were convinced and they put their faith in Jesus. Like I said, I don't think these are um, brand new faith for the first time that the miracles caused faith, but I do think these are, like I said, they're convinced. And because they're convinced now, they put their faith in Jesus. All right, a couple of others, a couple more. Um, kind of a little bit scattered that maybe I couldn't so neatly and uh, put into a bigger categories. You have the John chapter 10 account um, after the man born blind. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Um, and you could categorize that with the unbelief part, um, but, but maybe confusion and doubt. So again, miracles, maybe not so simple as we think. Um, accused Jesus of being crazy, possessed by a demon. Matthew 12, all the people were astonished and said, this, could this be the son of, of God? Um, this was the case of the, that guy who was really messed up. <laughs> That's not a very good summary. But uh, in Matthew chapter 12, he was, I think he was demon possessed and blind and mute. Um, just a mess, and Jesus healed him, and it led to questions. And so here, and then I guess I put those two together, because here it's negative questions. Why, why listen to him? Um, sarcasm and doubt and reluctance. But here, I, I take this as a more positive one. Um, questions, though, could this be? Is, is it possible? And certainly a much more productive response. So those uh, are a few of the reactions. I, like I said, I tried to kind of clump a bunch of the miracles together. I did see some commonalities there. Hopefully you, um, you saw them too. And um, don't say, Pastor Holtz, we think you are, are mad um, out of your mind. Um, I think, yeah, some commonalities there. I was thinking about this too, though. When else does a display of God's power cultivate curiosity in the mind of even the unbeliever? So I don't know that a miracle was going to create faith. I don't think that the Bible really teaches us that. 
But I do think miracles like early on news spread about Jesus and people came from all over the place to hear about him. I was just trying to think of today. So we don't have miracles. Jesus is obviously not walking the earth publicly doing miracles, performing miracles. But are there displays of God's power today that might cause a similar reaction where it gets people's attention? And this is what I was thinking, a couple pictures. Um, isn't that the case sometimes with natural disasters? Um, whether it's an earthquake, it's a hurricane, it kind of shakes us up a little bit. Wildfires um, reminds us maybe that we're not so tough and independent. And I think um, kind of causes people, we've got that inborn God curiosity because God created us and he's the author of life. And that means I have to say amen very soon. Um, so I won't go too much deeper in that, but natural type of displays of God's power, I think sometimes cause people to, to ask the deep spiritual questions. And what do I have here? Sadly, those twin towers in New York. I forget exactly. It's been a long time now. But the attendance percentage of people going to church the week after the twin towers fell was like a if I recall, it was like a 42% increase or something like that. Um, why? So here you've got natural disasters. Here you've got man-made hatred. But it unsettled us, right? And it made us question. And it made people reach out and search for some answers. And uh, sadly, how, how many weeks did it take for the baseline to go back to normal? If I recall, it was three weeks or something like that, that 40% um, spike had gone back down to normal. So yeah, there's all kinds of lessons about the sinful flesh there, isn't there, and, and humanity. Um, we seek answers when we get shaken up, but we go quickly back to forgetting. Uh, but yeah, I think God still maybe gives wake up uh, today in a little different ways. Um, quickly, really consider some non-miracles. Um, that Jesus did not perform. For example, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus allowed him to be beheaded. Jesus allowed him to die. A lot of people died in Jesus' day, but he loved John the Baptist. And why wouldn't he take care of him? And he was related to him, and, uh, but he let him die. Um, so Jesus didn't just, you know, perform miracles, you know, haphazardly either. Um, they had their purpose. And John the Baptist fulfilled his purpose, and he, he was allowed to die. Uh, Jesus arrest, maybe, obviously, but Jesus could have prevented that. Everything with Holy Week could have been prevented. His death, his crucifixion had to happen. But just a reminder that Jesus also withheld his power um, times as well. I thought that was worth mentioning. A closing thought very quickly. Your friend is struggling and prays to God for help, the miraculous kind. He doesn't receive the help he was looking for and says to you, I guess I just don't have enough faith. How would you respond to that? So he asks for help. He prays for a miracle. And he said, I guess I just don't have enough faith. Um, I'll give you a hint. I won't flesh it out entirely. What, How I would approach it, I guess, is what's his answer? Where is he looking? Um, is he looking up or is he looking in? And I would suggest the that needs to switch, you know, the places that he's looking. I think you know what I mean. Okay, closing prayer. Let's close. Um, there's a hymn that we don't sing very much. It's got a, uh, that's kind of one of my themes for this class too, I think, picking out some hymns, but the verses, this one came to mind as I was preparing this Bible study because uh, I was looking at the miracles at Cana. I don't even know the title of this hymn. I would have to look it up quick. Um, my hymnal's not in front of me. But verses four and five, it's a beautiful epiphany hymn. And I thought we would close with these words at Cana, miracle divine. When water reddened into wine, the faithful saw his glory shown and put their trust in him alone. All glory unto Jesus be, and praise for his epiphany, whom with the Father we adore, and Holy Spirit evermore. 
Amen to that, right? Well, thanks for uh, viewing and uh, look forward to next time. God bless you and be with you as you study his word and he promises he will. <laughs>